but you're prevented from doing the things that you desire to do. So it's not saying that you can't do the right thing, but it means that you won't just automatically do the right thing and it be real easy all the time. We get better at some things than others. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm like really aren't that much of a problem for me anymore that used to be a problem, but I don't know if you're like me, you realize there's always something new coming up. And then sometimes there's those things that you think you've totally conquered and you haven't had a problem with for a long time and all of a sudden it comes back to life and you're like, where did that come from? I haven't had a problem with that for a long time. But I think walking with God is a lot of fun. It doesn't have to be a burden. We don't have to think, oh, this is so hard, you know, these battles all the time. I just personally have come to the point where I just make a game out of it. It's like a goal to defeat the devil every day. It's like, it's like a goal to keep the junk out of my mind and to try to get through one hour without complaining about something. I still need help in that area. How about you? It is amazing how blessed we are and what we can find to complain about. Why? Because we're in a war. But we're soldiers in the army of God. And if we fight the way God fights, we'll always win. God is on our side. Hey, come on, you gotta get this. The devil's fighting all by himself. But we've got God on our side. Well, we've been talking about the different names of God in the Bible. And the reason why I'm doing that is because a name tells you about someone. They're properly called, especially the ones in the Old Testament, the redemptive names of God, because each one tells you something that you can expect God to do for you. And we started out with Yahweh, which literally means I am. And that's still my favorite. I love that thought that who is God? He is. Hebrews 11, 6 says, those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God has a reward for those that are faithful. You have a reward coming. And I could even go so far as to say that I believe that since you took your time to be here this weekend, many of you made a real investment to be here. You've spent money for hotels and you've traveled and just sacrifice time, and I believe that you will have a reward. When we make right choices, there's always a reward that comes in our life. God doesn't owe us anything for us making right choices, but he loves to bless his children. So I always like to tell people, payday's coming, amen? And um, so we've talked about a variety of these names. I'm not, I cannot go back over all of them, but the reason why I wanted to do this and why I'm calling it Who Is God is because I think that God's reputation in the world needs to be better. I think that we need to do a better job of letting God shine through us so people can think better of God. A lot of the division in churches and the, the foolish ways that some Believers act, especially people that are publicly known, and then they do all kinds of goofy things that gives a bad name to Christianity. It's a shame the way that the world now seems to disrespect God. And so I'm busy trying to make his name famous, and I'd like you to help me. Amen? Um, and obviously, there's lots of other people doing the same thing around the earth. Who is God? Well, he's just absolutely the greatest, the most high, the most amazing, the most wonderful. I mean, he's just everything and anything that you could ever hope for or want. And my contention is, is that anybody who really knows God, any person in the world who is not a believer or who claims to not believe in God or even those who don't have a relationship with God, anybody who really knows him could not possibly not want 
to have a relationship with God. <laughs> Period. End of the conversation. In Him we live and move and have our being. God is not a sideline to me. He's the main line in my life. He's not just something. He's everything. And I know that many of you feel the exact same way. So we've gone through several of these names and we have these messages from the weekend recorded if you weren't here and you'd like to get them. And today I have three of the redemptive names left that I want to go through and then end up with a few things about the name of Jesus because the interesting thing is that all these other redemptive names that we see describing who God is all culminate and come together for us as New Covenant believers in the one name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. You know, it's interesting to me, I, I don't know about you, but I, even when I speak that name and I purposely think about what I'm saying, I almost feel like I can sense an atmosphere change. There's something powerful in the name of Jesus. Let's all say, Jesus. One more time. Jesus. One more time. Jesus. Wow. There's no other name that does that for me like the name of Jesus. And so today we've come to the name Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord our banner. And it basically means that he is our victory, or he's the one who gives us victory. And we can really expect God, expect God, not just have to kind of wait and see, but we can expect God to give us victory over sin, over addictive habits, over all kinds of bondages, over a painful past, victory over the enemy, he is in the business of giving his people victory. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. In Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, the Bible says, those who know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand strong and do exploits for God. I love that. If you know God, not just if you go to church, going to church is lovely, I highly recommend that everybody be very regular in being plugged into a good local church where you can learn and grow and be accountable, but it's those who know their God. I went to church for a lot of years and didn't know God. Is there anybody here who agrees with me that you can go to church a long time and not know God? You can know doctrine. You can know church rules. You can know religious regulations, but that doesn't mean that we know God. And sadly, very sadly, heartbreakingly sadly, the way that religion presents him sometimes is so far away from who he really is. It just seems like that many times, by the time somebody gets you very indoctrinated in religion, you just, everything is deep and serious and sad and sour and you can't enjoy anything and everything is about what you can't do. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do something else. Well, what about the things we can do? Let's think about the things we can do. My Bible says that Jesus came that we might have and enjoy our lives and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And the only things that God asks us not to do are the things that are killing us anyway. All the rest of it, he wants us to enjoy and have fun. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't have fun anymore. It means that you have more fun than you ever have in your whole life because you can enjoy things that other people couldn't even possibly enjoy. Lighten up. Get over yourself. Come on. Religion is intense. But Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your souls. Actually, the Amplified Bible says, I will give you blessed recreation for your souls. And so literally, if you understand that, you can live your life with your soul on vacation. 
Thank God in him, you don't have to wait to go take a trip to enjoy yourself. You can enjoy yourself every day of your life. Amen? Some of you are thinking, oh man, this has been so great. I hate to go home. <laughs> but see, you're already setting yourself up for a fit when you walk in the door. You're going, ah, man, this house is a mess. And I told you, man, 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 man. And then people think, yeah, well, going did you a lot of good. But you maybe ought to go back again. So don't dread going home. Don't dread anything in your life because Jehovah Nisi, the one who gives you victory, is with you. You have victory in your life. I mean, if a sink full of dirty dishes is going to depress you, what hope is there for anything else? Yeah, in case you didn't hear me, I said if a sink full of dirty dishes is going to depress you, No, you're a soldier in the army of God. You attack those dishes. You attack that closet that needs to be cleaned out. You stand up to the things you need to do. Matter of fact, why don't you on purpose do the hard things first and just get them out of the way. Let's stop being so wimpy and whining about everything. Let us, those who know their God shall be mighty and do exploits. See, I had to start with little things like that in my home. I can tell you the truth. If this, if these things that I'm teaching you are not working in your home, then you can forget about them working anywhere else. If the only place where we have the victory is in church, then we have a deep problem. Amen? Get it working at home where it really counts. Exodus 17, 8 through 15. Then came Amalek, the descendants of Esau, and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek, and tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now, God had placed his power in that rod that Moses had, and it, that rod was what was stretched out over the Red Sea when it parted. So Joshua did as Moses said, and he fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the hilltop. And when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and when he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. <laughs> but Moses' hands were heavy and grew weary, so the other men took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. So don't ever complain about your seat. He was sitting on a rock. Then Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, and we all need people to hold our hands up when we get tired and weary. Amen. And that could be your whole ministry. You're, you may not be called to be the main person. You may be called to hold up somebody's hands. And Joshua mowed down and disabled Amalek and the people with the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, and I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. And verse 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, which means sign of conquest. So really in essence, when he said, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, what he literally meant is make no mistake, God is the one who has given us this victory. And let me tell you, God is a God who gives victory. And whatever situation you're in right now, you need to stop being afraid of it, and you need to know your God, and know that you can do whatever you need to do, and that however long it takes, and nobody knows exactly what that is, but the battle's already won, and when it's over, you will have the victory. You will have the victory. I know it by experience, and I know it by the Word of God. Now, one of the areas that God always gives us victory over is sin. But I want you to notice in what we just read in Exodus, and this is going to be kind of a, a, a high point of what I want to bring to you this morning. Moses followed God. He did what God put on his heart to do. And when I go back all the way to the condition I was in, 
when I first got into a real serious relationship with God. I was a church goer a long time before I got serious. And I always like to kind of share that because I think a lot of people are going to church and they think that's all they need to do. But what you need is victory. And if you don't have victory, then you need to start asking yourself why. And you need to start looking at the word to see maybe what you're missing that's available to you. God has called us to be lights shining out brightly in a dark world. And that doesn't mean we have no problems, but it means that we have victory over our problems. Amen? And so if I look all the way back to the condition I was in, I mean, God has given me so much victory in my life. And it's been 37 years worth of little victories and little more victories and little victories day after day, little by little. And you know, part of our problem is we don't like the little by little. We don't like the from glory to glory because in between those glories, there's sometimes a pretty long span of time where not too much of anything is going on. Amen? But as I look back, I can tell you that it wasn't just because I loved God or just because I read the Word of God. I give God all the credit and all the glory, but let me tell you, you and God are partners. And God will give you things that He wants you to do, and He will also tell you some things that He doesn't want you to do. Some of them are in the Word and they're for everybody, but there are things that God speaks to us specifically, things that He lays on our heart that are just between us and God. Times when maybe He requests sacrifices. There was one time when I had a whole bunch of money saved up for something I wanted. <laughs> and I mean, we gave on a regular basis. We weren't stingy people. We were givers. But God asked me to give away everything that I had saved. <clears throat> Man, I tried to get out of that. But you know, the best thing is, is to follow God when you feel like he's leading you to do something. Now listen to what I'm going to say. God is never, ever trying to take anything away from you. He didn't need my little money that I had saved up, but it was something that I was a little too attached to. And sometimes God will request something from us because he wants to get us detached from our attachments. And when we say, God, you're first and you're everything, sometimes he asks us to prove it. And I can pretty much guarantee you that some of you are still holding on to things that God told you to get rid of a long time ago. You're still in relationships, friendships that are hurting your walk with God, and you, you know down deep inside that it's something that's not healthy for you, but rather than be lonely for a little while, you, you keep unsafe relationships rather than maybe be by yourself for a little while and wait for God to give you the right relationships. So I want to tell you that along with all those little by littles and from glory to glories, there has been a lot of little obediences and little things that God asked me to do. And some of them were things that didn't make any sense. And some of them were things that I did understand. And I just feel that I really need to make a point today that when you're, when you're born again, let's just say you're living in total darkness. Now you step out and you're born again. Well, one of the first things you begin to realize is, hey, somebody has provided for me, somebody being Jesus, this awesome place down there as an inheritance where there's righteousness and peace and joy and all my needs are met. And I, boy, it's just going to be wonderful. I'm going to be free from all these bondages. But you, you can kind of see it, but there's a jungle between you and it. And that jungle is that mess in our lives that needs to be straightened out. And we have a road map through that jungle, and it's the Word of God. It's our road map. And if we simply will just one step at a time, one thing at a time, one step at a time, one thing at a time, one step at a time, let me tell you something. Get over being in a hurry and make a decision today that you're in for the long haul. And don't ever say to God, if I don't have a breakthrough soon, don't say that. We can't threaten God. What we need to say is, God, I trust your timing in my life. 
and this is hard because it's been so long, but I'm in for the long haul. I'm in for the long haul, and I'll tell you one even better, and you can even go ahead and say, go ahead and say, and God, even if I never get what I want, I'm still in. Even if I never get what I want, I'm still in. I'm all yours because nothing makes any sense except my relationship with you. Let's quit having all these conditions that God has to meet to keep us serving him day by day. My gosh. I mean, so many things. <laughs> and I believe with all my heart that any person in here who is still under a burden of sin, something that you can't seem to get free from, there's some kind of bondage or addiction in your life, maybe it's bad temper, maybe it's bitterness. So many people have such a hard time not being angry about the things that have happened to them in their life. And that is so destructive to our walk with God. You cannot have unforgiveness in your heart and have a great relationship with God at the same time. It just doesn't happen. It's in the scripture from one end of it to the other. If we won't forgive other people, then we can't receive forgiveness from God and it hurts our fellowship with him. And you know, let's just take that as an example. My father abused me for many years. My mother knew about it, didn't do anything about it. I even had other relatives, male relatives that had also abused me. There was a real mess in my father's bloodline. And I mean, I had a bad case of bitterness and resentment and a chip on my shoulder. And even after I was already in ministry, because I had, I had done the, what I call the official, I forgive you thing. You know, most of us that have been walking with God for very long, we know that we're supposed to forgive. And so we'll, we'll say, I forgive. But a long time after that, when God really began to deal with me that it still wasn't what it needed to be, he, I, I said, it's hard. I don't know how to do it. And God said, if you'll pray for them and bless them, they were older by then, needed help, help take care of them. Well, that's the last thing in the world I wanted to do. I didn't want to do that. They didn't deserve that. I was the one that had been mistreated. They never did anything for me. And I mean, I had my conversation with God. You ever notice that sometimes God says something, you argue with him, and then after that, he doesn't say anything else. It just kind of hangs there like. <laughs> I always like to think about Jonah. Jonah, go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, so he went the exact opposite direction got in a storm, got swallowed up by a whale, spent three days in the whale's belly, got vomited out on a beach, finally went back to God, and God said, go to Nineveh. <laughs> Come on, we can avoid a lot of side trips in our life by just doing what God tells us to the first time. Please understand, that obedience is important. Yes, there's grace and there's forgiveness for sins and there's mercy and God's never going to stop loving you no matter what you do. And maybe you'll...
get into heaven. It's not our obedience that gets us into heaven. It's faith in Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what, I think we need to stop pushing the envelope and we need to get really committed and obedient to God. And this morning, I want to talk to you about really letting the Holy Spirit sanctify you because he is also Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us. And that means to take the holiness that's in us by his grace and mercy and work it out in our lives. What if we have holy minds and holy mouths? What if we have some holy relationships? Come on, there's too much compromise in the church today. Too many people have got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. They want to do what the world does and still think they're going to go to heaven. And it's just not working. Follow God. Don't expect him to follow you. Amen. Don't make your plans and then pray that God will make them work. Pray, see what God says, and then make your plan. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 14. Three scriptures here. But thanks be to God who in Christ Jesus leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory. And through us spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. God always leads us in triumph. Am. A Amen. Amen. <laughs> AM, and not just in the AM, but all day long. <laughs> Mercy. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Now, sin is the sting of death, and sin exercises its power upon the soul through the abuse of the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. How about if every day early in the morning we say, thanks be to God who gives me the victory this day and every day of my life. Jehovah Nisi, he is our victory. Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us. And what that literally means is God is the one that changes us. Oh, that's relaxing. I don't have to try to change myself. God will do it. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Now, does that mean that there's nothing for me to do? No. I need to put the grocery cart back. I need to pray for my parents. I need to help them in their old age, whether they were good to me or not. There's thousands of things like that throughout my life. And you, how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You go through this all the time, all the time. Well, let me tell you something. Every time that you obey God, and I might even add, the harder it is to obey God, the more valuable it is to you because when we do what's right while it still feels wrong, we are growing spiritually. Let God into these areas of your life. You don't have to go to Bible school. It's nice if you want to, but you don't have to. You can get a degree from the school of the Holy Ghost if you'll just let God be involved in everything you do everywhere you go. Leviticus 20 verse 8 says, I am the Lord who sanctifies. When we try to perfect ourselves, it only causes frustration, struggle, and failure. Now we should want to change. The more I read the word, the more I want to change. We should pray to change. We should study the word in the areas where we want to change and make choices that go along with the change that we want. However, it is only God that can ultimately change us. Boy, what a relief it was to Dave when I found out that I couldn't change him. that only God could change him. And then it was even quite shocking to me to find out that maybe, just maybe, God liked him just the way he was. <laughs> I couldn't quite figure that out, but 
And then even beyond that, and this was really hard for me, that maybe it wasn't him that had the problem. It could be me. Oh, my gosh, this growing up thing is so hard. I can still feel the pain in my soul from all those years of trying to learn how to just keep my mouth shut sometimes. Because <laughs> you see, sometimes the thing that God will whisper that's between you and your victory is just, you don't need to say anything. <laughs> Come on, does anybody understand what I'm talking about? I'm going to be very honest with you. To me, living this life with God, doing life with God, and being obedient to Him everywhere you go, in the grocery store, out, you know, whatever it is, to me, that's more important than if you answered a call on your life to go to Africa and live there as a missionary all your life. I think a lot of people maybe will submit to do these big things that's going to impress everybody but when it comes to the little private things that you don't even wouldn't even be worth telling anybody come on we have a private life with God he is Emmanuel God with us he lives in us and everything about our life should be dedicated to him Paul writes to those that he calls consecrated, purified, and made holy in Christ Jesus. Let's look at Philippians 2, 12, and 13, quite long in the Amplified Bible, but very much worth looking at. Philippians 2, 12, Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm that you would show in my presence, but much more when I'm absent, and I love this, it's almost like, a pastor saying, okay, you behave in front of me, but the thing I really want you to do is go home and behave at home. Come on, you, you know how it goes. Dave and I would fight all morning and fight all the way to church and argue in the parking lot and have the kids all crying. But boy, when we saw the first person at the church, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Get in the church service, sing the songs, jump up and down, and I'd be thinking, if he thinks I'm fixing him anything to eat today, he's getting anything to eat. Come on, that's not consecration. That's phony, baloney, religious. It's me pretending something that's not real inside. Get in the car and fight all the way home, then get mad because Dave watched football on Sundays and cry the rest of the day and feel sorry for myself. And I went to church. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. We went to church. So not only when I'm with you, <laughs> but when I'm absent. Now watch this. Work out. I'm going to start over because I don't want anybody lost. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now not only with the enthusiasm that you would show in my presence, but much more because I'm absent, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, self-distrust, serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation. Sounds like a lot of work to me timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. And boy, I love verse 13, not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire to will and to work for his good pleasure. So long, you may have missed half of it, but basically what he's saying is, okay, when you're saved, you have all the good stuff in you. Man, you got it. You know, you've been made right with God through the blood of Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. But now that righteousness needs to be worked from the inside of you 
to the outside of you. So the first thing that happens is God begins to new our, renew our mind and teach us how to think right. And then when we begin to think right, we'll begin to talk right. And then we'll begin to act right. And then we'll begin to treat people right. And so now a little bit of what is in us has been worked out through us where maybe somebody else can witness it and believe that God is real and believe there might be some hope for them. And it's a lifelong process. He who began a good work in you will complete it and bring it to its finish. Now, you know, when I really fell in love with Jesus and started reading the Word, I mean, I, I had a whole different set of problems because the more I read this thing, the more I saw that was wrong with me. And it was very hard to go to church and not go home depressed because I don't care what anybody preached on, I needed it. I mean, I had every problem. I just didn't have some problems. I had every problem. Does anybody kind of feel like, okay. So, but let me tell you something. Conviction is totally different than condemnation. We need to be glad for conviction and resist condemnation. And what I would do is the Holy Spirit would use the word to convict me, whatever it was. You talk too much. That one always worked. You talk too much. And so then I would go home, I would go home, and I would decide that I was going to fix it. So I would decide then that I was going to not say anything at all. And then the same people that were telling me, you talk too much, can't you ever shut your mouth, now were telling me, what's wrong with you? Why are you not talking? And so then I would do what we always do. You're never satisfied. I don't care if I don't. If I talk, you don't like it. If I don't talk, you don't like it. I oh, no, we just never change. There's no, I can't suit people no matter what I do. Say so what I should have done and what you should do, if I say anything today that God uses to convict you in any area of your life, don't you dare go home and say, well, bless God, I, I heard I'm going to change. No, you're just looking for another disaster. What you say is, God, I agree with you. I felt your conviction. And I agree with you. You're right, and I'm wrong. And I repent. I want to change and turn away from that. And now I trust you, who has begun a good work in me, to complete it and bring it to its finish. I trust you to change me. Now, here comes some really good news. I don't know if you can handle this or not, but you can actually enjoy yourself while God is changing you. You don't have to wait till you're perfected to like yourself. I like myself right now. And I still have a long way to go. <laughs> thank you. You have to learn how to say, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. First Thessalonians 5.23. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. Separate you from profane things and make you pure and holy consecrated to God. And may your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 24. Faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy, and he will also do it. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. And then you, you so you go, yes, God, I want that. Lord, I want that. I, I want to be holy in every area of my life. And then it says, okay, trust me, and I will do it. God will work it out in your life little by little from glory to glory. He shows you something by his grace. You do it. You fail 20 times. You finally get it right. There's a little change. God shows you something else. You're stubborn for 10 weeks. Takes you two years to put the grocery cart back. You finally get it. Okay, God, I'm, you're not going to leave me alone. I'm going to put it back. And there are just thousands of little things like that. But part of the purpose of somebody like me doing what I'm doing is I can save you a lot of turns around that same stupid mountain if you'll listen to me. If God is telling you whatever, whatever it might be, stop playing on your computer all day at work when the boss is not looking.
Because here's the truth, it's stealing. Don't do anything behind your boss's back that you wouldn't do if he was watching. Okay, well. Come on, how many pencils and ballpoint pens do you have at home that came from your place of work? Now, you know, I, you, whatever, you do what you want to with this, but I'm telling you, there were times in my life when God said, you gather them all up and take them back. And I've learned how to try to be obedient to God in all these little things. And I don't have to do that to go to heaven. We don't have to do this to go to heaven. I'm talking about doing life with God. I'm talking about living for God's glory. I'm talking about living a sanctified life. Listen, I'm going to heaven even if I take pencils from the office. I don't go to heaven because I do everything perfectly. I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, there are some things that I think can get you in worse trouble than a pencil, but my point is, is I'm not talking about legalism and, and living this life that makes you a nervous wreck because you're petrified you're gonna do something wrong all the time. Yes, I could have left the grocery cart out there and let it chase cars around. I could have done all kinds of things. I could have done that. But now watch what I'm gonna tell you, I wouldn't be here today. I was complaining to God one time because I just felt like he was just, you know, pretty strict with me about what I could and couldn't do, what I could and couldn't watch on TV and the kind of movies I could go to and different things like that. And it was all just stuff between me and God in my heart. And you have the same kind of stuff going on. And you know, when God asks you not to do something, don't go back and tell them, well, everybody else does it. You're not everybody else, you're you, and God's got a plan for you, and if you listen to God for you, then you can have the blessings that God has for you. If everybody else in the world wants to do without theirs, that's up to them. And so, I mean, I, I knew pastors and other spiritual people who did a lot of these things that I felt like God was telling me I couldn't do, and I just got kind of ticked off. And I was just like, well, God, I don't understand. Everybody else does this stuff, and you know, you're still using them. And boy, 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 I still remember it. He said, look, you've asked me for a lot. Do you want it or not? <laughs> Sanctification, separation unto God for a special purpose. We are separated unto God for a special purpose. I'm talking to each one of you individually Stop acting like you belong to yourself because you don't. You've been bought with a price, paid for it with a preciousness. You are no longer your own. You belong to God. You are a vessel that should be set aside for his use. So it goes like this. God, here I am. Your will be done and not mine. Whatever you want, wherever you want me, it's up to you. You know, we need to live without all the mixture that we have in our lives. Way on Sunday in a different way the rest of the week. One of the greatest compliments that anybody can give you is to say that you live out during the week what you say you believe when you're in church. In Revelations, there's a lot of interesting scriptures. I won't take time to go through many of them, but in Revelation 2, it says you've done good works, but you've left your first love. Not everyone, Matthew says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom because I never knew you. He told some they were clinging to false teaching. You know, it's very popular today in the name of freedom to support everybody in their own particular belief, no matter how cultish or unholy it is. We call it tolerance. Well, you gotta be a little careful with some of the stuff that's going on today. You might work with somebody who's off base spiritually and living in some kind of sin, and it is important that you're cordial and present yourself in a loving manner. You can't preach to people everywhere that you go, but neither can you agree with them and let them think that whatever is okay, because whatever is not okay. 
What's the essence of what I'm saying? Let's let God do that sanctification work in us where every day we're moving deeper into new levels of holiness and new levels of commitment to him. And you know, one of the things that I would like to ask today, are there people here that are ready to make a deeper commitment to God? You're ready to let him get out of Sunday and get into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and into the grocery store and into the marketplace and where you work and where you go to school and into your neighborhoods. Don't tolerate Jezebel anymore. We don't need to tolerate sin. And on and on and on and on. I don't have enough time to do it all. Jehovah to Sid Canoe, the Lord our righteousness. My goodness, I love that. Let me tell you something. You need to learn how to separate your who and your do. You may not do everything right, but you are God's child and he loves you and he's never gonna stop loving you. Amen. Amen. And if you just throw your heart open to God today and you say, God, I want your will in my life, please don't ever stop working with me. God will work with you and work with you and work with you and work with you. And you don't have to be condemned. You don't have to not like yourself while you're in the process. Listen, I'm enjoying this thing with God. I'm enjoying this. God change me and make me more like Jesus every day. Please don't ever leave me alone. Don't let me just live like an idiot and not even know it. Tell me, God, the things that you want me to see. Let's quit all this, oh, get another thing wrong with me. Be glad that God loves you enough to show you when you need change in an area and then ask him to change you. God, change me. You're the only one that can change me. How many of you have been struggling with yourself trying to change yourself and it's just been so frustrating? Are you understanding that only God can change you? Only God can change you. Whatever you hear today that might convict you, what you should do when you leave is say, God, I agree. I heard you speaking to me. I want your will. Now I ask you to change me and whatever thing you might want me to do or if you want me to do nothing, show me what it is, make it plain and give me the grace to do it and I'll walk it out. But when push comes to shove, God, only you can change people. So man, we got it all. And then over here in the New Testament, we've really got it because we've got the name of Jesus. The name that is above every name. Let's look at Philippians 2 verse 8. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of the death of the cross. Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name that in and at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Now, we've been given that name. We have been given the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus. You know, there are times when I will tell people, well, call my office, and if you have any trouble getting through, tell them, Joyce told me to call. So I give them permission to use my name. And that is just so very minor compared to what we're talking about here today. When we use the name of Jesus properly, Jesus said, it's no different than him being there. When he left, he sent us the Holy Spirit and he gave us his name. And he said, now you can pray in my name, and when you do, you're presenting to the Father everything that I am. Aren't you glad that you don't have to present what you are when you go to the throne of God? I love that. But let, let me give you a little insight that I got a few years ago, and I love this. I share this pretty often, but I can't not share it here today. You know, when I married Dave, I got his name. And now I can, I can use his name. It's my name been given to me. And when Dave and I got married, he had money. I didn't have any, and all of a sudden I had money. <laughs> Good deal. Amen. <laughs> when we got married, I didn't have a car, and Dave had a nice, pretty new car. Man, all of a sudden I had a car. <laughs> well, you know, that's pretty much the way it is when you come into a relationship with Jesus. We come pretty much bankrupt, and he's got everything. And then all of a sudden, because we've got him, now we've got everything.
But here comes the really good part. However, I didn't get any of that while we were dating. Are you dating Jesus? Or are you married? Amen? When you're married, then you share everything. What's mine is his, what's his is mine. I get his name, I can use his name as if it was my name. But that means faithfulness in every area of my life. Amen? Let me tell you something. God is everything that you will ever need him to be in any situation. How can anybody possibly know God and not want to have a relationship with him? He is your peace, your righteousness, your sanctification, your victory. He is the one and only true God. He's everything that we need him to be. So don't let him be too little in your life. Let God be big to you. Go to him for everything, all the time. Let's let him be number one, amen? Amen. Well, the gospel is good news for us. We learn in it that we don't have to struggle to try to change ourselves. If we allow God into our lives because of who he is, he will change us. We do need to cooperate with the work that he wants to do in us. We have a free will and we can resist him as well as submit to him, but God is the one who does the work. It's his strength in us that makes the change. And so look more to him than you do to yourself for the changes that you need.